Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Austin and Kowali Days 2015, everyone. You having a good time? Yes. Hope you learn a lot. Uh, past attendees have said it's a mind-blowing and stomach-satisfying experience, and I hope that that is the case for you all this year. How many newcomers do we have this year? Can you raise your hand? Look to your left, look to your right, help these people out if you've been here before. And again, everyone, welcome, welcome to Austin. I'm Jennifer Foudy, I'm the Executive Director of the Kowali Foundation, so my warmest welcome to all of you. I'm gonna speak briefly to get us in order and then I'm gonna turn it over to some more exciting speakers than myself. Once again this year, we're having our plenary at Kowali Days on Veterans Day. So happy Veterans Day to all of you, and I'm actually, I'm gonna ask all those who have served to please stand and be recognized by your peers. Please stand, please. Thank you for your service and thank you for being here on what is a very special day. You have, each of you on your chair, a souvenir chopsticks for you to take home. For those of you who have been with Kowali, you know that this is an annual tradition and each year there's a new theme on your chopsticks. This year, it's a little bit different. Simplify. You may have been hearing about this, and I'm gonna let Joel DeLynn, who's speaking later, talk a little bit more about what that means to our, our koala ecosystem as a whole. It's quite exciting, I think, and one that will be of value to all of us in higher ed for many years. So I'm going to turn it over to our conference chair for Kowali Days 2015, Sean Phillips, who is the leader managing this program and managing this event for all of us. So from the University of Maryland, please join me in welcoming Sean Phillips. So, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, before I get started, I do want to share one thing. People who were here last year may re remember the, the closing luncheon. So uh, earlier in the, in the session, I was given the Golden Bucket Award. So I figured it's how I ended this last year, so I figured it's a good way to start this year. I know that about a, what, a third of the people here probably weren't here last year. Um, I uh, ended up having a migraine for the first time in my life. I didn't know that's what was happening. I literally thought I was dying. Thank goodness uh, Barry took me to the emergency room um, I, I literally was calling my daughter, my wife, you know, saying goodbye, basically. Um, so it was, it was quite a way to, uh, to do a presentation. I came walking into the, the closing ceremony with the trash can from my room. So I, I got the Golden Bucket Award today. So thank you all. And, and thank you, Barry, for getting me to the emergency room. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, very excited to welcome everybody to, to Austin, Texas. Great city, it's one of my favorite cities in the United States. Um, not only are we gonna have a great time with, with community and learning about the quality products, um, supporting each other, um, helping each other through the, the process of, of software for higher ed, by higher ed, but there's also great music, great food, just a, just a great city to be in. Um, some of the places I would suggest, of course, is the Continental Club, down in South Congress. Just right up the street is the Mohawk um, Parish, and just literally a couple of blocks away is Beerland. And of course, there's Stubbs nearby if you want food and barbecue. Um, Z Tejas is, is just down 6th Street with Waterloo Records there. It's a world well known record store. So there's just so much to do here and, and, and see. So enjoy the conference, enjoy Kuali, but definitely get out and see the city also. It's a beautiful place. Need to make sure to uh, thank our sponsors. Our distinguished sponsor is uh, Navigator Management Partners. They have a booth just right here in the, uh, the entryway, all the sponsors do. Some of our other sponsors, Laserfish, HTC, Salesforce Foundation, and of course the only name that's probably harder to say than Kuali is Skaduna. And I did stop by the booth to make sure I said that right, so hopefully I succeeded. Thank you all to our sponsors. And I also have to make sure to thank our planning committee. Um, Jennifer was way over generous with saying that I was the leader of this group. Uh, honestly, so many people did so much. 
Um, the entire planning committee involved uh, in the details and the day-to-day. -day. The conference track chairs for pulling together their, their sessions themselves. Of course, Jennifer Foudy. Um, the concentric conference management people, uh, Jen Cummings and, and Kathy, you're going to see them at the registration booth. Please go by and thank them. Um, and of course, a very, very special thank you to Mike Almendinger, who picked up anything and everything. He, he was wonderful. So I'd like to invite Mike up on stage to give him a very special thank you. Uh, literally, we would talk about something that needed to be done, and hours later, it would be finished. So thank you so much, Mike. Thank you. This, this, this couldn't have been done without him. Um, he was just incredible what he would do. So I, I may have the title of chair, but I think Mike did all the work, so thank you, sir. And with that, I welcome Brad Wheeler. Thank you. Well, good morning to everyone, and especially to our many uh, international visitors who are not only adjusting to uh, the great Texas barbecue available here, but also to time zones and waking up what may seem like the middle of the night. So we're really grateful that you're here as well. My role is the chair of the Kuali Foundation Board, and I have a few things I want to share with you this morning as we head into this very important <clears throat> Kuali days as part of our second decade. So as the Kuali community, and especially those of us who are gathered here today, reflect on this past year, we have had an extraordinary year. We've taken some really important steps for our second decade that continue our journey and that is to uh, continue to drive Kuali's founding mission. And if you haven't thought lately about our founding mission and when we got started and what we've been doing over the last 10 years, our mission remains solely to help colleges and universities succeed with their mission. So since I got in on uh, Monday evening, up and down the hallways, receptions, various uh, meetings, and uh, even at Educause, which was just two weeks ago, some of you were there, there is a real excitement when people are putting their hands on the products that are coming out of this community right now and seeing the work. And I also want to say, I, I just know how much hard work the entirety of this community has put into this last year. We've really thought long and hard about what it would take to succeed as the world was changing around us in our second decade. We've been critical, we've thought, we've tested assumptions, we've challenged each other to make sure that the choices that we were making and the direction that we were heading is really what we needed to do to continue the journey to achieve our mission. This transition over this last year uh, it was, has been one of learning, and I want to say I know not every idea that came from me or that came from you or that came from any particular person uh, has been without thought, debate, tuning, refinement, and I think it's very important to just affirm that's what makes this community work. We are able to talk with each other, to debate with each other, to test, to improve, backtrack if we've made a mistake, and go forward again. And that's why we're still here going in our second decade in a world that's changing around us. I know many roles have changed, uh, and I can say as a chief information officer at Indiana University, uh, we felt a lot of those roles change ourselves roles in technical work, roles in the, the functional design and functional work, roles on boards. And these are all aimed to help us go faster, to streamline our ability to make quick and rapid trade-offs and provide multiple paths for institutions to succeed with their goals. So if there's any single central message that I want you to leave Kuali Days with this year, it simply is this, Kuali is for all. It is for the institutions with existing local on-premises implementations, 
that went early, those who moved very early. And I have to call out Vincent, who is here from uh, Nairobi. They were the first to go live on the not yet released Kuali financial system in 2005. It was flown over in a pizza box server. And I understand you've recently upgraded to uh, Kuali Financial System 5. Is that right? Vincent, can you stand up so everybody can? <laughs> Great. So, so when I say some went early on an international basis, we really, really mean it. And uh, it's been working there for them uh, uh, over these many years. But our other early adopters, Colorado State, Arizona, Indiana, MIT, University of California, Davis, Irvine, Michigan State, Maryland, many others, you know the roster. Many of us have large, complex implementations of various versions of Kuali software that have evolved over the years, and we need to keep those moving forward. We need to know our options in the future. We may continue doing that. At some point, we may go to off-premises. We need to continue to enhance our user experiences. We need a quicker pace of features, uh, punching out the roadmap, and we do much of this through the continued engagement of our member institutions and partners in work with Kuali, the company. Kuali is also for the new institutions, for those who are just now getting to a point of transition and needing to solve a problem to enable their mission. They may want to go to cloud right away, to SaaS, they want products that fit higher ed, that are made for higher ed, and they want the unparalleled risk mitigation that the quality community offers. Uh, this is an opportunity with the configuration we're in now, I think, to grow and invite those members who really need a SaaS solution and they want to move quickly in ways that we've not been able to accommodate before. And it's for all the others in between uh, who value the ability to turn our ideas into great software, mitigate our risks, and drive forward with the things we need at our institutions. So if you'll allow, and those of you who know me well, know that from time to time I have to regress into business school professor format. Um, I'm a bit of a closet economist. You know I'm the CIO at Indiana University, and some may not know. Uh, most recently, I've picked up the, t the title of Interim Dean for the School of Informatics and Computing. So uh, that's an adventure in and of itself. And I want to emphasize the word interim, not a candidate, uh, but opportunity to help on that side of the house. Um, I feel just a little bit compelled to want to walk the community through a few very important tenets of how we intentionally are evolving our ecosystem. And that is uh, Kuali the foundation, Kuali the company, and Kuali the community in an interconnected and very intentional way. So now those of us in higher ed who are on the buy side of big systems, ERP systems, learning management systems, and a range of all the little thingies that we seem to need now for our uh, university, some of them from the cloud and otherwise. You know, over the years, we have really become frustrated with some of the unsavory business practices that plague the behavior of some of our corporate suppliers, partners, vendors, friends, whatever you want to call them and seems best. You know, when I go to gatherings of chief information officers uh, in higher ed, uh, or even ones that are uh, outside of higher ed, uh, across industry, it seems the same corporate names get wailed about over and over again in the problems that we encounter. But yet, I deeply believe, and this is a truly important point, if the coffee hasn't kicked in, kind of you know, jolt the person next to you, um, that sometimes the shorthand of, well, .org is good and .com is bad is an oversimplification. It glosses over the root causes of the behaviors that drive us crazy sometimes uh, from the folks that we work with. And so that's why in this community, we did create the company to do all the good things that a commercial model is especially capable of doing. It can feel the imperative of, to urgently meet and satisfy the needs of its customers, hire top talent, drive difficult trade-offs in timely ways. 
the company can convey a clear, unified, practical, understandable marketing message that can be understood by new adopters. It can respond to those long RFPs that universities are so talented in writing. And it can lead a range of services needed to help each type of institution. The company's customers are members of the product boards, the financial uh, product, research, ready, student, and others, who may be evolving and converging their local implementations. The company's customers are also those institutions who choose to buy hosted cloud-based software as a service and proceed in that direction now, or just know they want a path to it in the future. Likewise, we also form the company in ways that mitigate the pressures and the root causes of the dysfunctional behavior that sometimes drive us crazy as buyers in colleges and universities. So when we look deeply in the root causes of some of those bad behaviors, you know, we see that they're really, off. they're not bad people, they're, they're not. They're just being driven and motivated by the whip of short-term venture capital sometimes where the firm is the product to be flipped and sold or merged for a quick profit uh, by someone, or the firm becomes overly beholden to hitting big quarterly returns for its shareholders or other investors who want maximum returns every quarter or every year. My pension funds are invested in Wall Street through lots of these firms, and I like for my pension funds to get great returns. This is not disparate on the system as a whole, it is descriptive of the kind of firm as part of the quality ecosystem we sought to create. So thus the company was capitalized with patient capital. It cannot be bought, sold, or merged for 10 years without consent of the quality foundation. Its software licenses cannot be changed without the consent of the quality foundation. It is open source and I'm sure Joel will em emphasize that in a moment. Two years ago, to be clear, the Kowali software code produced by our community was available for download as open source. Today, tomorrow, two years from now, 15 years from now, the Kowali code produced by this expanding community will be available as open source with an open source initiative, OSI, approved software license that embodies the very definition of what open source actually is. Yes, I agree. Now, that is, that is a very important economic point for our colleges and universities because it gives us a tool for risk mitigation and control uh, in the future. It's not the point about the wonders of open source and community and design and production. That's a discussion in and of itself. I am talking about the sheer economic risk mitigation at our institutions when we have a tool to negotiate should something not be in our interest uh, in the future. So I can tell you, at Indiana University with the hundreds of software contracts that we have with many firms, some for on-premises work, some for cloud work and all, that I am quite certain if all of those products were available open source, we would have a much more satisfactory conversation as we negotiate terms from time to time. I know some of these points are a little bit in the weeds when really everybody here, the core thing is we want great software. We want confidence in its future evolution, and we want assurance of fair cost. And all of that is easier said than done, as uh, the last few decades, for those of you uh, who've been around this for a while, if you back up or over a few decades, whether the, the effort was a large one or a small, whether it was commercially driven or it was an open source product, even homegrown efforts, things written at our own institutions, have all proved that achieving those things is a difficult journey. But yet, we believe the design of this Kowali community is hugely important. It is distinct, and it is a contrast relative to any other offering out there. This foundation 
this company and the whole of this community are working together to serve colleges and universities. We are not here for banks or auto manufacturing companies or pipe fitting companies or consulting firms. We are here driving for our mission for higher education. And that is a distinguished and different value proposition than any other in the marketplace today. I, I also respect that others may try to recreate this in some different way, anchored in other historic economic models of the past, but we've learned so much over the last decade. And this is how we're continuing to drive forward the very mission that first started Kowali yet some 10 years ago. So now back to the mission of our colleges and our universities. My president at Indiana University, Michael McRobbie, some of you heard from him a few years ago, he recently and rightly made the strong case that, quote, much fiction is written regarding the notion that universities are not changing. Now, while some elements of that statement may be fair debate in the bar later tonight, uh, the journey for many of our great research universities, our community colleges, and every category of instance, uh, institution in between has been for decades, for centuries, for millennia, adapting to a changing world around it. Universities are highly resilient and highly adaptive. But there is no time in recent decades, if ever, when the pace of change in the economics, the fundamental economics of higher education, our responsibilities to our stakeholders, the scrutiny of that responsibility, and changes in technology have combined at a faster rate. We see far greater pressures for managerial, not just financial, reporting as budget scrutiny grows. Compliance, particularly for research and federal contracts and grants, grows. Student services, advising, curriculum roadmaps, all driving to simplify the student experience, make it go faster. Those pressures are particularly intensifying at state-funded institutions. Cost pressures to contain administrative cost while redirecting resources to education and research is accelerating. And I can tell you, speaking for Indiana University, we have closed, merged, or created eight new academic schools in the past five years. That may be a land speed record because the needs for education are evolving and I know we are not alone in making these changes. So each of us here today, we play a role in this journey for higher education. Some teach classes and some register students and protect the integrity of the academic record. Some conduct research and some enable those grants to meet the very stringent regulatory frameworks of federal law or from some of our funding agencies. Some spend a lot of money, like me as a chief information officer, and some enable the financial management and compliance that ensures the integrity of our institution in the eyes of the public. So what we, the folks who are here, what we do control is many of the members of this room is the cost and the capability of the systems and the business processes at our institutions. Our world is evolving and the expectations in user experience, if Google released it yesterday or Amazon did it the day before, my goodness, why haven't your systems reflected that elegance? Uh, the pace of change. These are all accelerating expectations in the work that we do with our community. So I do think, I do think that we have also learned some very important lessons over the last 20 years of big systems, ERP systems, or whatever label you wish. Whether it's the systems from the big vendors, whether it's quality, or even the new cloud providers, we all see and we know that rabid local customizations over time are very, very expensive to maintain. They slow us down, they cost a lot. They come by many names and each has some passionate, absolutely reasonable need to exist.
but I do think this is one area where this community in particular can and we must look for ways to do better if we are to better align our software to the whole of the needs of the changing economics of higher education. The quality financial community who met yesterday the, uh, of early adopters, this is one of our communities that is leading the way to get back to a common base of software that enables the fundamental economic value proposition of coming and working together. So let me ask you, which would resonate more with you in your user community? If I uh, actually hold up materially a $100 bill here, would your user community rather have another $100 sitting in the budget for disposable income, or would they rather have better code faster? I suspect for many of us we'd say, we'll take the better code faster, and we, want to, we need a process that turns our ideas and our dollars into code that our users value. So that is what we are working to achieve as a community, as a company, and as a foundation and as our individual members. It's hard work to make great software that fits higher education, but this is our work. This is essential and this is highly beneficial to the missions of our institutions. So I, as I reflect on where we're at in this Kowali days, I am doubly encouraged that we have done this before. We embarked upon bold goals that some thought improbable or our, our path seemed curious. Now this month, it was 10 years ago, one decade ago, that the first Kowali Days gathered in 2005 with an audience a mere fraction of the size gathered here today. And over time, we proved that as a community, we could build great enterprise scale software that met our needs, could be installed, have clean audits for those with the, the quality financial system and sustain it through a community. But it was just one year ago again that we embarked on a model and an evolved quality ecosystem that could go faster, could make it easier to produce beautiful software and a next generation architecture, support both on-premises or cloud options and retain those essential economic risk mitigations that have always been central to who we are as Kowali. So I do want to affirm that the progress of this community in just 12 months has been nothing short of breathtaking and remarkable. Even if I, even if we, have made some mistakes along the way in the depth of our communication, in the clarity of how we worked through this, we are at that point and moving forward with a Kowali ecosystem. Kowali is for all. So now in a few moments, Joel Delenn, the CEO of the company, will show some of the work that's already been achieved and uh, to both refresh the existing Kowali products and to accelerate some new ones. Uh, he'll be followed by Pat Burns, the Chief Information Officer at Colorado State University, a, an engineering professor and semi-reformed librarian. Uh, and no partner has been more essential and deeply engaged than the vigilant work of our community friends at Colorado State University. Many of you know CSU, who was the very first big research intensive university to implement the young Kowali financial system before it was even publicly released in uh, version three. So in 2004, I spoke at a higher ed open source gathering, not Kowali, uh, at a conference regarding what are the must haves what are the essentials for a vibrant open source uh, software uh, uh, project? And I think they are the three C's. They're the code, coordination, and community. If you don't have great code, nobody wants to use it. If you don't have efficient coordination, then you struggle to turn your ideas, your passion into dollars that make better code for the products that people need. And you need a passionate community of ideas, of users, of adopters who really understand this stuff. That higher ed does have some complexities that are innate and important to who we are and what we do. 
I see all three C's present in this Kuali community and in the products that are emerging. You will see them here at this Kuali Days in the Experience Center at the many tutorials uh, around the conference sessions the next two, uh, two days. I hope you will take it all in as much as possible because I am immensely proud of what we have achieved in yet just the 12 months since we last convened. With that, it is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Joel Delenn, CEO of Kuali, the company. Thanks, Brad. Uh, this is such an important picture because at the end of last year, at, at the end of Kuali days of last year, this is how I felt. I felt like let this is going to be an absolutely amazing year. If you remember at the keynote, that's what I, I said. I said, let's, what are we going to do this next year? It's going to be incredible. Let's go out and just do amazing things in one year. Because we talked about the amazing things that had happened 10 years before and gave some examples in the industry of how much can happen in 10 years. And I challenged us all to do something amazing in one year. And this is how I feel after one year. <laughs> this is probably how many of you feel. When I read some of the tweets and when I read the internet, uh, let's see, in the last year, uh, uh, some of the most amazing things have been, people forward to me things that people say about me personally on the internet, uh, and it's fun to read. Um, Pseudo-technical pseudo -technical babble was one of the things that uh, was said about me. Uh, an idiot, uh, completely unqualified for this job. <laughs> What, uh, 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 I, I take all of those as compliments. This is what I care about. Higher ed software is expensive. Higher ed software is ugly. Higher ed software is inflexible. And it doesn't have to be that way. And that's why Kowali is here. 10 years ago, Kowali was founded to solve those exact problems. And it was really about three things. It was about cost, it was about having a great community, and it was about having control. So after 10 years of Kowali, we talked last year about the amazing things that have happened. Some really great products have come out. Now, sure, there have been some missteps, and there have been some things that, you know, some products that didn't work out so well. But there are some great products that are being used now in your institutions, and they didn't cost $100 million to install. And they're not costing you $50 million a year or whatever the crazy rates are for you to be able to support. We have reasonably priced software, and by price meaning what it costs you to run locally, or the cloud offering, I guess. But we've got good software that is made for you for higher ed. We have over 100 institutions that were using our software, more than, uh, much more than, than just 100. So I think we had a great success the first 10 years. But we reassessed and realized there were some issues. From a cost perspective, it cost a little bit more than we thought it, than we thought it should to develop the software. The stampede hadn't happened yet. So yes, we had 100 institutions, but we didn't have 1,000. Why weren't we getting to 1,000? And from a control perspective, the development was a little bit not as, it wasn't quite as fast as we'd like it to be. So we'd like the sort of the quality of the software and the speed of the, of the development of the software to improve. So in 2014, we reimagined what Kuali could be like. Now, when I say we, I wasn't here. But the Kuali community reimagined what this software and what this community and what, uh, uh, what Kuali could be like. And what you decided to do was to create a company that combines the best parts of a community with the best parts of a company. So that looks like this. We have a community, which is you. We have a foundation, which is also you. Our partners, our, uh, uh, the people that are running uh, uh, software on premise and so forth. But we also have a company. But we created a company that's different than a normal company. First thing is we're open source. And we'll continue to be open source. I mean, the clapping later resonated. We, want, we will continue to be an open source company. And that's something that traditional vendors don't do and won't do. 
The company, the investor in the company, and this is something I didn't realize not everyone, not everyone knew, knew this. I, I read an article recently by somebody on the internet who clearly didn't realize this was the case. The Kowali Foundation is an investor in the company. It's really, besides myself, the only investor in the company. We're not taking private equity. We're not taking venture capital. We're not taking investment outside, and that means we're not beholden to Wall Street. We're not beholden to quarterly profit uh, calls. We're not beholden to cost cutting just because we want to squeeze out that little last dollar for investors. We don't, we, we don't have to worry about that. The owners of the company are the foundation and the employees. So we're not beholden to Wall Street. But, but who is the foundation? Who is the owner of this, one of the owners of this company? It's the colleges, the universities, the partners. It is the foundation, and the foundation represents you. They have a board of directors, a permanent board of director seat on our board of directors. So Brad Wheeler, who again, not compensated in any way, but he represents the foundation as a director on our board and has access to all of our financials and all the details. And someday it won't be Brad. Someday it will be somebody else from the foundation, but it's a permanent preferred directorship from the foundation on the company's board. So what's the stewardship? Brad talked about this a little bit before. The, the preferred director of the Kowali Foundation can prevent us from being sold. It can prevent us from going public. It can prevent us from trying to change our open source license. Now you need to know when we created this company, these are our intentions anyway. I've been in venture capital companies before. I've been in companies that have gone public. The reason why I came to Kowali was to create something different. I wanted to solve those problems that we talked about at the beginning. Software is too ugly. It's too expensive. It doesn't solve, it's not flexible enough. I wanted to create a company that cared more about the product than about solving some investors' uh, uh, problems. So we built some structure into the company to help us preserve that. We're also creating a culture. So every Kowali employee that, get, that gets hired goes through this cultural uh, uh, orientation. Every month, we, have, we give every employee dollars, and those dollars can be spent to give to other employees for, for representing these cultural values. They're very, very important to us. So every time a customer comes to visit us, we've had, we've had customers uh, for a grand total of probably 150,000 miles this year have flown in to, to visit us, and every time they come in, we show them our culture and try and help them understand what, what's important to us. So what's happened in the last year? These were the original reasons why we created the company when we reimagined Kuali. Remember the four? The first is suite, to create a complete suite. The second is speed, accelerate our delivery. The third is suite design, create great thoughtful design in all of our products. And fourth, create a self-sustainable entity. Each of these is important strategically for us. So let's talk about each one. First, the suite. Enterprise resource planning. So you, you, may, you may have heard the term ERP. So it's something that started in the corporate space, has moved to this space. Think of ERP as big, huge, monolithic systems. They're systems that do everything. How many of you are using an ERP in your enterprise today? That's a lot of you. I was sitting in a CIO board of the biggest CIOs, uh, the, the biggest companies in the world, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, General Motors, and I was a member of this CIO exchange, and there were 30 of us sitting in a room, and I remember the, the facilitator asking, how many of you are happy that you went to an ERP? The answer was zero. Billions of dollars had been spent on these ERPs, and the value just hadn't, hadn't been there for a number of reasons. First, it's for, from a higher ed perspective, it's typically repurposed corporate software. We take corporate software, we gerrymander it a little bit, and we um, in, install it in higher ed. And the result is, you'll see in the news, I don't want to bring up any specific examples, $100 million installations, $200 million installations, two years over budget and over, oh, uh, over time. The, getting these corporate ERP systems to work for us is hard. Vendor lock-in. So you're locked into these ERP systems for a number of reasons. They're all or nothing often, which means you take the financials, you're gonna take the HR, you're gonna take everything. It's sort of an all or nothing type of, of a prospect. And again, the big money for the implementations. The other thing about these ERP systems is that the, the implementations are lengthy. It takes forever to get them done. 
You also have a gap between getting new features. If you're doing a new version every two to three years because it's so expensive, during that two to three years, you're not getting the new value. That's ERP. And I say no to ERP. I say we don't need that. We don't need that in Kuali, and we, uh, we don't need that in our institutions. So what's, what's, what can we do instead? Now, you might expect that I'm gonna give you a pitch for cloud right now, but that's not what I'm gonna give you a pitch for. I'm gonna give you a pitch for what, what changing about the software. And whether you go to the cloud or whether you run it on premise, this is a strategic decision for us to, make it, to, make, to allow us to avoid the ERP problem. So let me give you an example of what I mean by a service, okay? Imagine if you had a server that was serving up data and information through a nice applica application programming interface for courses. And if, imagine if you had the same thing for programs and you had the same thing for approvals. It's just a service. Any developer could call those APIs. Well, we did that. We created a curriculum management product and it's awesome. So if you haven't seen it, come see us because we'd love to show you the new curriculum management product. Oh, I said awesome. <laughs> Nat has told me 50 times not to say awesome anymore. I'm sorry, Nat, it's brilliant. <laughs> Nat's from the UK. We created a curriculum management product that are using these three services. The cool thing about the services is that you can write your own custom applications to use those services too. Now, note, I didn't say customize the code because we're creating pr application programming interfaces so that you can use those application programming interfaces and create whatever you want. Mobile applications, custom applications, portals, SharePoint sites, Excel spreadsheets, whatever you want, use those APIs. Just don't customize the code because if you do that, it'll be very inexpensive for you to get new releases. We're gonna create a whole bunch of services like that. So over the next three to five years, starting immediately, we've already started this, we're decoupling our monolithic applications into a set of services so that you can leverage those services. So the first ones are courses, programs, approvals, authentication, those are, and there will be many, many more, dozens of services that you'll be, you'll be able to use. So our own applications, like curriculum management, like financials, like a uh, conflict of interest module, like financials, like all of these different products will use these services. But you'll have access to the exact same services. Again, whether you run on premise or run in the cloud, you will have access to those exact same services. So you'll be able to write your custom applications, but we're also signing up third party applications. So we're creating a, a, a sort of economy, uh, ecosystem of third-party applications that will also be leveraging these services. The first of which is here today, Skaduna. Skaduna is a company, it's a startup, they've got a brand new product, and they're using our curriculum management APIs in, in order to create a really nice, interesting degree mapping system. There will be many, many more companies like Skaduna, similar to what we did in Instructure. There are hundreds of companies that have written add-ons to the Instructure Canvas product that you can, that you can, some are open source, some you need to purchase, but there's this great ecosystem. We'll create the exact same thing with Kuali. So let me give you just a quick update on the suite itself. We're moving away from having just a suite, a monolithic suite, and to instead a set of individual services. So we've started along the student information system path, uh, which we'll talk about in the product uh, uh, presentation later today. We've made great strides in refactoring our financials product and our research product. We have our business continuity planning product. We will be either partnering or building an HR product, and I'd like to, we'll talk about that. We'll have a lot more to talk about next Kuali days uh, to talk about HR. Accelerated delivery. Well, we launched the company. So we finally got the company launched. We got all the, all the contracts in place and started hiring people in the sort of January, February time frame. And we really staffed up around February is when we had the, the, the staff in place. And this is what we've built. Now talk about speed, speed of delivery. We built a brand new from scratch ready product, business continuity planning product a from scratch curriculum management product. Now we used all the great functional analysis that the original student team did, but we built a brand new product and it's beautiful, both ready and curriculum management. There's a new conflict of interest module. How many of you have seen the conflict of interest module? What do you think? Awesome. awesome. <laughs> Nat, it's not just me. 
It looks great. It's very, very configurable. It's very, very fast. It's a great product. We've built a new financials portal that Eilish has either talked about or will be talking about um, uh, this week. And we have new cloud offerings. We've taken the research product and the financials product. We've removed the state. We've, we're finished with research. We're in the middle of financials, removing all the state so that we can have stateless offerings in the cloud. And that's the main point of being a cloud offering is to get all that state. That's all been done in the last year, plus three from scratch, fully multi-tenant and scalable product applications. For one year, I think that's pretty good. Thoughtful design. So the very first, one of our first two employees was an interaction designer. And we now have four designers, one designer per product that are dedicated to creating great products. These designers meet with each other every day, every morning. They meet together and they share with each other the designs of the different products. So financial shares with students, student shares with research, and they comment on each other's designs. If you haven't been to the Experience Center, I strongly recommend that you go to the Experience Center and meet these designers. They'll take you through some of the exercises that we do We've spent a ton of time on site and on video conferences with you to design student, to design COI, to design ready. So we appreciate your, your help and your feedback. It's integral to the interaction design process. And what we've created are some pretty good looking screens. Let me just take you through some of them. This is our visual workflow. So, so it's not the most beautiful product, but what's cool about this is it allows you to configure your own workflow. It's very, very easy to use. It was built for curriculum management for the student product. Now this sounds, seems a little crazy, but it's a word cloud report that allows you to get word clouds for things like learning outcomes to see which learning outcomes are, are being used most, most often. This is just another analytics report that shows you of the subject codes that are available in your institution, the ones in the upper left, English, and you can mouse over those, has the most. In the bottom left, it has the least. Now, I pick these because they're unique and interesting. We do normal charts and normal graphs as well, but there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of opportunity to do interesting analytics in our products. All of this stuff is exportable. Export to CSV, export to an image, export to PDF. This is financial. More financials. This is the portal, the financials portal that Eilish will talk about. The dashboard. This is quality research, conflict of interest, and it gives you an idea of where we're going with, with design in general. One thing to notice here is it's drag and drop. It's mobile. Screening questionnaires, completely configurable screening questionnaires. If you want to enter in new questionnaires, you don't have to reboot the server. You don't have to go talk to a developer. You just go to the config screens, add in what you want to, to, to show up, and they show up. I think from a design perspective, we've made a ton of progress over the last year, and I hope that you're seeing that and, and uh, that you appreciate it. And we'd love to have you involved. We'd love to get your feedback and have you in our contextual inquiries and to have you involved in, in what we do from a design perspective. So self-sustainable, this is an important one, and this is where kind of there's a rub, there's a conflict sometimes, and I just want to talk openly about the conflict. One of the points of creating a company was to create something that's self-sustainable so that we could bring in, instead of 100, 1,000 customers who were all sharing the burden of, our, of research and development, which will allow us to accelerate. If we want to make progress on HR, we need to accelerate the self-sustainability of the company. That's the whole point. So one of the ways that we do that is with cloud customers. So these cloud customers are important, and sometimes there's a conflict. Sometimes the on-premise people say, oh, those, you know, I, quit bugging me about the cloud. You know, all you care about is the cloud. And I can see why you think that. I can see why some people think that. And I want to talk about that openly. That said, having cloud customers is important because it funds our research and development. Just like you're funding the research and development with, with uh, on-premise uh, implementations. Let me talk briefly about the benefits of the Quali Cloud. First, it's built for higher ed from the ground up. And these are the benefits. I'm not trying to sell you on the cloud. This is what we're talking to the market about. So I want, I'm trying to be accountable to you to let you know what we're doing to create a self-sustainable company. So when we talk to the market, we're built for higher ed. 
we're lower risk because we're open source. If, you ever, if we ever start to become evil, if we ever start to overcharge, if we ever stop, stop innovating, you can take your code, you can take your data, and you can run it yourself. We're scalable and burstable in the cloud, which means if you're getting ready for a big semester or you're getting ready for a big research, um, a, a PI has a big uh, a proposal they're putting through or whatever, we can, we can increase the number of servers that are dedicated to what you need. It's a very, very modern look and feel. And we're not completely there yet, but in the last year we've made a lot of progress. We're fast. So we're very, very performant. And in places where we're not very performant, we're fixing it. We're knocking them down one at a time. We're secure. So um, uh, we have an operations team who's a world-class operations team who have run very, very large and very, very governmentally secure uh, uh, data centers. So we're a secure platform. Most importantly, we're easy to integrate with. And this goes back to my point about being a set of services. All of our products, we intend to be best of breed products, which means individually you can take our financial product, individually you can take our curriculum management product, individually you can take our financial aid product, and you don't have to go with the whole suite forever. We're not gonna force people to use the whole suite. You can use one component, and we're making it very easy to integrate with those individual components. So this is our Kuali Cloud. We have customers we have, uh, who are making feature requests, our developers work on the code, and we release it. So we release today our research product two or three times a week to our cloud customers. So two or three times a week, we're putting new functionality out there. It's the same for student. We're putting new functionality there two or three times a week. The difference in our cloud is that we put those features behind what's called a feature flag. So every cloud customer has a staging environment and a production environment that we provide to you. And when we do a big new feature, you have the ability to go to the staging environment and turn on the feature and try it and see if you like it. And then when you're ready, not when we're ready, when you're ready, you can turn the feature on in the production environment. So it's an important strategy for us that we're getting value out there all the time. You don't have to wait two years, but you can turn it on when you're ready for it. The other thing that's interesting about our cloud is what I talked about before, the fact that we have APIs, and the same APIs that we use for our own applications are available to you to do any kind of sort of customization or, or mashups or products or mobile apps that you want. You can use the same APIs. Okay, now, sometimes we're confused, so I want to I wanna confess that. Last year at Kuali Days, for example, the foundation talked to us, and the foundation, oh, I said, what is the number one problem that we have? What do you think the number one problem that the Kuali community had was to the foundation? Any guesses? Customizations. If you look at the 23 implementations of KFS, or there's more of those, every one of them has their own code base, every one. Now, on one hand, that's great because you can do all the customizations you want. On the other hand, everyone is on an old version. Nobody is on the most up-to-date version, and that's a problem. So the message from the foundation to us was help us be focused on getting everyone on the same code base. Whether it's in the cloud or on premise, focus on getting us on the same code base. And so that's what we did. So almost all of the sessions as of nine months ago for this were about using APIs and not about customizing. And then a lot of people got frustrated about that because they said, look, I, I'm not there yet. I need help. I'm, I've got an old version today. I need to know your new stack. I want to learn. And so we changed. We added a technical track. Originally, the birds of a feather sessions were off in a separate place because we were trying not to make a big deal about customizations because the foundation wanted us to get on the same code base. I think th those were mistakes. So we're trying to learn from those mistakes. And I'll give you another example. People are going to throw things at me because I'm bringing up all these bad things. Oracle. For the research product, it was, we thought it was most efficient for us to focus on one single database, one, a database that's free. So we focused on MySQL. We talked to the KCC about it, and the feedback was, go for it. That's no problem. Individually, the school said, wait a minute. We can't do that. Oracle's our standard. If I talk to the DBA team, they're not going to support MySQL. So we changed. We I apologize if that made people frustrated with us. And I hope you'll keep giving us feedback so that we can make those changes. Because for us, cloud customers are not our only customers. On-premise customers are customers too. And we, we, we appreciate all of you. And we want to work together to create a product that works for everyone. This is the team. 
So uh, this is our executive team. We've got product managers for, for each of our core products. So we've created the company, and this is talking about self-sustainability. We have a lot of employees. These are our full-time employees plus our contractors, and we're growing at one or two a month. This is just a sampling of the nearly 150 people in our community, some of which are cloud, many of, most of which are, I guess most of which are cloud, many of which are, are uh, on-premise. So what does self-sustainable mean at the end of the day? Profitable. That's, that's what self-sustainable means, is that we make a profit. And what do we do with that profit? We reinvest it in R&D. So when we sign a new contract, and this was confusing to some people, when we sign a new cloud contract, what do we do with the money that we make? We don't pay a venture capitalist or a private equity person. We go hire more developers and designers. Every time we sign a new cloud customer, one cloud customer that comes on that pays us whatever their amount is, we take that money, we reinvest it in research and development, which helps every one of you. These are just our new cloud customers in the last year. I think there's 16 on there, 15 or 16 on there. The two at the top are just our brand new ones. Southern New Hampshire University is coming on as a curriculum management uh, uh, cloud customer, and University of Washington has announced, uh, announced yesterday in their session they were in the middle of a, of, of a rollout of the old curriculum management product, and they paused it, and they've decided to move to the cloud instead. So let's give a hand for Southern New Hampshire University and University of Washington. We're just unbelievably excited to, to work with both. We have 5,600 leads, so you should have seen the booth at Educause. It was unbelievable. Jennifer mentioned to me that in the 10 years of Kowali, we've never had the kind of reception in a booth that we had this last Educause. It was unbelievable. All day long, every day, we had four monitors, and there were probably five or six times that all four monitors were full. And there, it was 20, all the time, at least two of them were full. So just continual, and 5,600 leads have come in the last year. We've had 750 webinar participants. So these are people that have looked at our product, products, who are your products, who are, who are interested in some way. We have 330 new opportunities in the pipeline. So for us, an opportunity is somebody that we're actively talking to about one of the products. In the last, for most of this year, we've averaged about one cl new cloud customer per month. We're now starting to get to two new cloud customers per month. And next year, we think we'll get to three or four new cloud customers per month. So that will continue to grow. And the interesting thing is 99% of the new leads that we talk to are not interested in on-premise implementations. They're interested in the cloud. Now, we'll always support on-premise implementations forever because we realize that some of you just don't want to go to the cloud for whatever reason. We respect that, and we're okay with it. You're a customer, too, and we'll continue to support you. We also have this great opportunity for, for these new cloud customers. So what's next year? So when we think about what our focus will be for the next year, we think about it in four things. Speed of development, quality of design, self-sustainability, and completing the suite. So we're looking forward to continuing to do those things. In the product session today that will come a little bit later, we'll talk about each of the individual products and what's happened. But I just want to tell you that we're committed, even though we're exhausted. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to Saturday because I've been traveling for about six weeks straight. I'm looking forward to getting back up and starting again and creating products that you can be proud of. Thank you. We're going to turn the time over to Pat. I'm Pat Burns, the Chief Information Officer at Colorado State University. And actually, you can summarize my job with four words. Uh, first two words are to minimize complexity. And the second two words are what you saw on the screen before, which is to ask, what's next? So I want to talk about the odyssey that we at CSU have been on and as a community, the odyssey that we've been on. And I think, as you heard, we went live July 1st, 2009 on pre-release version 3 of KFS. And by we, I mean us. We had people at CSU from Arizona, Indiana, and UC Davis. So that was a team effort that we uh, participated in. And the community, I think, went live. 
And that was pre-release version three. I never would have gone live on a pre-release version of vendor software. That's how much faith I had in the community. And we didn't have a plan B at the time. We were going live July 1st, 2009. And around January 1st, 2009, we looked at what we had left to do to go live by July. And we figured we couldn't do what we had to do to go live, plus continue to run our existing FRS system. We stopped development of our FRSS system January, and we were going to go live July 1st, 2009 with KFS or not have a financial system. So that is community. And I think that was a great thing. So let me look out at you. How many of you remember where we were? We're here in 2009, 2010, and, and saw the implementations and implemented yourself. Can I see a show of hands, please? How did that feel at that time? That felt great at that time. That's exactly right. Good to great. That's our feelings and not just our progress. And you know, we've heard both Brad and Joel talk about what happened one to two years ago. Uh, where's the stampede? We didn't see the uh, adoption rates that we wanted. Um, and the board talked about this for several years. And it was clear that things just weren't working the way we were organized. And we had to change. So as an example for us, uh, we, we saw development on KFS kind of stall. Uh, we saw code come out um, kind of late and a little buggy. Uh, and in fact, we took a seven year run up to KC before we actually deployed the first uh, module. And it just wasn't working. It really wasn't working for any of us in terms of where we were going with the future. And clearly, we had to change. And of course, we did. You heard what happened with Kuali Inc. Um, and we've refactored ourselves, we're recalibrating ourselves, and as Joel says, that's a work in progress. So where are we now? Um, I think you heard about lots of the brilliant things that Quali Inc. is doing, uh, and there's a lot of attention now to larger schools and complexity and dealing with the complexity uh, that sort of uh, has come along in the last several months. And I'm told by our friends that there are actually more than 150 customers right now. Um, but let's talk about where we are. Anybody read the book of John Adams where he has a chapter in there, Facts or Stubborn Things? Show of hands, anybody? Yep. So let's talk about some things, some stubborn facts. Hobson's choice, right? That's the only choice left. If we're going to succeed, to succeed as a community, we have to make sure that we properly resource you know, our development arm, Kuali Inc. Um, and we need more revenue. And if we have more revenue, we can further accelerate development. But last, in the past year, we've seen small reductions in Kuali Foundation members. We've seen small reductions in participation in some of the uh, projects. And so I'm sitting here thinking, so. What should be our sense of urgency right now at this point in time? And uh, you know, are we going to keep our heads in the sands about this? Or what do we as a community decide to do ourselves now? And I'm kind of halfway in between complacency and true urgency for where we as a community need to go. But I firmly believe we did great things in 2009 and 2010. We can do great things again, controlling our own destiny. But we have to do it together as a community with a capital C. So here's my calculus. Kuali has to succeed. Let's see a show of hands. Does everybody believe that Kuali has to succeed? Yeah, I see all the hands going up. In order for Kuali to succeed and the bigger quality community, Kuali Inc has to succeed. And in order for Quali Inc. to succeed, we have to succeed both in the venues of software as a service and on-premise implementations. And we're happy to see lots of attention being paid to that by Quali Inc. today. 
And in fact, we have our provost, Rick Miranda, who's shown up there, and he's a wicked smart mathematician. And he's encouraging us to take good risks. Well, that was a risk that we took in 2009, but we carefully looked at that. That was a good risk. We ought to get ourselves around um, the philosophy that what's going to differentiate higher ed institutions, particularly state-funded institutions, in the next decade are those who wish to take good risks. Um, and you can see that our provost uh, has intentionally have us, has us looking at cloud services. So if we looked at cloud service or software as a service, typically when that's done right, it's better, faster, and cheaper for us. And when that's done right, it's going to be better, faster, and cheaper for on-prem as well as for cloud services. Um, I would dare say that there probably are no institutions that don't run something or have some service in the cloud today. You know, the exemplar is Canvas, I think, and, you know, Joel, was that was his baby when he was at Instructure. Um, can I see a show of hands? How many of you run no services at all or, no, or access no services at all in the cloud? Any institutions like that? No, I didn't think so. And what's really important for us is we're so hammered with uh, too much uh, issue of demands on our IT support and not enough supply of resources, people mostly, that if we can get better, faster, and cheaper anywhere, we can devote staff effort to other more important priorities. And if you look at where I think we have to go as a community with a capital C in the next year, we have to define a true baseline code with all the complexity and customizations in it that are common across our, all of our institutions. Then we have to have, that's the, you know, the baseline blue layer that's built into the code. Then we have to have configurability for um, needs that we have that aren't going to be in the baseline that might be particular to us. And we always have wants. And it's really hard for us to distinguish needs from wants. Can we be disciplined enough so that we reduce our customization? As Joel said, that was the biggest problem we identified last year. And this is our job before us in the next year, to march in this direction, to rededicate ourselves. We are Kuali. That's we with a capital W and capital E as a community. And if you look at the ecosystem, Kuali Inc. is inside that ecosystem. The Kuali Inc. has hired people from our institutions. These are people we like, we respect, and we trust them. It's all about mission, vision, and values. We have an instrument called Kuali Inc. by which we as a community can succeed. That instrument exists. It's up to us to make, take advantage of that instrument and make us all succeed again. And I'd like us to regain a sense of community. I firmly believe we can do this. And so the next great thing for us is that, getting through that next year, game on. And I always like that bumper sticker, you know, that I've paraphrased here, may God grant us the grace to be the good people our dogs think we are. And if a year from now we can think we're as good as our dogs think we are, having done this for the quality community, we will have succeeded. That's the task before us. And I challenge us all, each and individually and all of us, to march in this direction. We don't have a choice. And this is the best direction out there. This is what we all joined on for. And it's time for the next step. So in summary, I'd like to leave you with the following three thoughts. Quality is for everyone. You've heard that from all four of us today. We, we are Kuali as individuals and as institutions. Uh, and let's try to get, regain that sense of community and rededicate ourselves. And let's continue to do great things. We can do great things, and that will be to our benefit. So I'd like now to introduce Dan and Laura, who are going to tell us about next year's Quality Days Conference. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Pat. 
Laura and I are looking forward to being co-chairs for next year's conference. Our goal is to have a robust program where colleagues can meet, share experiences, and build a strong collaborative community. You may be like me. I'm a long-term staff member at a founding partner institution of the Kuali Foundation. I've been attending Kuali Day since 2007. I've held numerous roles across a couple of different projects. He may be more like Laura. Laura is a, a new employee staff member at Kuali the company. Um, this is her first um, Kuali, Kuali Days conference and she's seeing this event through fresh eyes. Whether you're like me, whether you're like Laura, or somewhere in between, um, we're all part of that Kuali community, and we're all keys to the success of Kuali in the future. Kuali Days is an event for the community. We get together, we share knowledge, we, we learn from each other, but Kuali Days is also an event that reinforces the community. We meet old friends, we do that all-important networking, and we, should say, we share the successes and celebrate those successes we've had over the past year. Laura and I hope that we can accomplish more of the same during Kuali Days 2016. So how can you help us? First of all, please, please use the evaluation form that's in the app. Give us that feedback. You can also talk to Laura, talk to me, talk to Sean, other people who have participated in, in developing this program. So give us that feedback. If you're leaving Austin today, we hope you've had a great experience. Um, if you are just starting your conference, we hope you have a very good week. Either way, we really, really appreciate any feedback that you can give us, and we will incorporate that into even greater conference next year in 2016. So Laura, I guess it's time to test this co-chair thing and actually make our first decision. So where do you think we should hold the conference next year? Well, it has to be a fun, decent-sized city. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. <laughs> and it should be a pretty place, uh, preferably with fantastic weather. Coming from upstate New York, I couldn't agree more. Ideally, it would be on the water. Ocean, lake, water should definitely be there. Sounds fantastic. Okay. Um, I think really great food and nightlife and some entertainment readily available would be good. Okay, that's very important for this community. I know it will be appreciated. And convenient to travel to. How about a, a hotel that's right across the street from the airport? As long as it's not too loud, that's perfect. <laughs> so pretty much, how about the whole package? I think that would be perfect. And you know what? How about we return to San Diego in 2016? <laughs> Easy applause. <laughs> so with that, it's time to say goodbye. Thank you to Austin. Thank you to all of you who are Kuali. And looking forward to seeing you in San Diego, November 14th through 18th next year.